won't touch them. No one. Police named the suspect in that van attack in London. This was quite clearly an attack on Muslims. Upsetting a city already on edge. Can we get back to the way we, we used to be? Calls for more rules in the ring after an Edmonton school teacher dies of head injuries. And the insiders are here with a reflective look at the art of backroom politics. How have Justin Trudeau and Donald Trump changed the way things are done? And how will it affect us? A wave of recent terror attacks is testing London's famous steely resolve. The latest last night, a van plowed into a group of people who were assisting a man who'd collapsed in the street. In the aftermath, that man died. Eleven people were hurt, nine sent to hospital. Anger is growing among those who were specifically targeted by hate. Nala Ayed is in London with the latest. It was a shocking end to prayer on a Ramadan night. To witnesses, it was clear right away they had been deliberately targeted. He was shouting, we're all Muslims, I want to kill all Muslims. Literally, he said that, word, word by word. He was the attacker, mowing people down as they left Finsbury Park Mosque. No one, no one, hey, no one. An angry crowd caught up with him, an imam saving him from harm. No one touched him, no one. Once in the police van, he waved. We pushed people away from him until he was safely um, until he was safely uh, 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 taken, put, uh, taken into taken by police into custody and put into the back of the van. We've been talking to people in this area, and there's not just horror over what happened here behind me, but there's also anger over the fact that it took a while to describe it as a terrorist attack. That anger is directed at the media and at the government. Can Britain take any more terror, Prime Minister? Prime Minister Theresa May, accused of being too detached during recent tragedies, did later call it a terrorist attack and drop by to visit. There is no place for this hatred in our country today. The attacker was named in the British media as 47-year-old Darren Osborne. The van rented near his home in Cardiff the third attack this year involving a vehicle. Three of the last four terrorist attacks here were carried out by Islamists claiming to act for the extremist group ISIS. There's been a spike in Islamophobic attacks since. The horror over last night, they prayed out on the street. But this is a shaken neighborhood. This man was at the mosque with his family and saw the scene afterwards. My daughter was crying, my wife is shaking, and, uh, you know, so I can't believe it, you know. London has barely recovered from last week's tragedy at Grenfell Tower. These have been a terrible few weeks for London, unprecedented in recent times. We will stay a strong city. I mean, nobody slept last night. Really. But some are concerned the attacks will devolve into tit-for-tat strikes. What has Britain come to? Can we get back to the way we, what we used to be? I hopefully, I, I, I hope we can. After weeks of this, the city is ill at ease. The government is now providing more protection for mosques, but there are also calls for more action against hate speech, seen as the fuel for attacks on all sides. Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. Paris has also seen its share of recent terror attacks, and there was another one today, though it appears the would-be attacker did not get the result he wanted. A driver rammed a car packed with weapons and explosives into a police van on the Champs-Élysées. Orange smoke poured from the car after the collision, but it did not blow up. The man, a French national who was known to security officials, was the only one who died in the attempted attack. Counterterrorism officers are investigating. In a case seen as a major test of Canada's anti-terrorism law, a Quebec man has been found guilty of trying to join ISIS. Ismail Habib was arrested last year after he told an undercover RCMP officer he intended to go fight for the militant group in Syria. 
It's the first such case being tested in court, where a person is tried for attempting to leave Canada to participate in terrorism and carries a maximum prison term of up to 10 years. It's distinct from the law convicting someone for committing an act of terror. Habib's sentencing date is set for August 17th. The federal government promised more than $100 million to help fight gender-based violence. Today, the details. More than $75 million will go to creating a centre within the Status of Women Department. The rest will be spent in other areas, such as public health, with a focus on preventing child abuse and teenage dating violence, public safety and fighting online exploitation, and the RCMP, which will give officers more cultural training. It will also gather more public data, which the government says hasn't been done on this issue since 1993. Human Rights Watch says it's documented dozens of claims of police misconduct against Indigenous women in Saskatchewan. It says its findings are most troublesome given the crisis of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in Canada. But as Bonnie Allen reports, some are saying the report is one-sided. Being arrested and thrown in jail would be scary enough. <laughs> Dozens of Indigenous women say police officers seized that moment to abuse them. Human Rights Watch interviewed 64 Indigenous women across Saskatchewan last year. Several women said that police officers physically assaulted them during stops, arrests and in detention. Human Rights Watch also documented inappropriate and abusive body and strip searches by male officers in every jurisdiction researched in this report. The report doesn't identify the women, but it cites one case that CBC News first shared. Three male officers wrestled Wanda DeChambeau to the jail floor and forcibly stripped off her bra. I felt really degraded. I felt humiliated. I felt cheap. The Elizabeth Fry Society likens an invasive search to an assault. Immediately we are going to call on our government to end body searches of women and girls by male officers in all but extraordinary circumstances. Female staffing shortages is an issue in smaller cities and towns, but both Regina and Saskatoon police say their policy is for female officers to conduct searches. Saskatoon Police Chief acknowledges there's a long history of abuse, but Clive Wayhill insists this report ignores measures he's taken to repair trust. I'm not trying to be defensive one bit, but there's no balance to this report. They give policing in general right across Saskatchewan no credit for the work that we've done in the past decade. Same reaction in Regina. Quite frankly, I think a lot of the recommendations there we're already doing. Police chiefs told us they're already working on recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, including hiring more Indigenous officers. This vice chief says there's clearly more work to be done. It's very disturbing as an Indigenous woman, you know, to hear that this is still going on after all the awareness, after all the media attention. Human Rights Watch and Indigenous leaders say mistrust of police is causing another problem. It's stopping women from reporting other cases of violence, and that endangers lives. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. First Nations along BC's notorious Highway of Tears have been asking for reliable public transportation for more than a decade. And now they're getting a new bus service for part of it. Two new routes connecting Prince George and Smithers will start next week. At least 18 Indigenous women have been murdered or have gone missing along the notorious stretch since the 70s, according to the RCMP, although Indigenous leaders say the number is closer to 50. Many of the missing and dead were last seen hitchhiking. There's still no bus to Prince Rupert, where the Highway of Tears ends. Indigenous issues were at the heart of a powerful ceremony in Ottawa today, honoring leaders and strong voices who speak up for those who cannot. But the man bestowing those honors is at the center of his own controversy. The Governor General is being criticized for how he characterized Indigenous people in a recent CBC interview. Margot McDermott has our story. It was a special gathering to recognize those who've worked to improve the lives of Indigenous people. The normally staid Rideau Hall erupted in cheers and applause for one of the first recipients, Gord Downey. 
the lead singer for the tragically hip who's suffering from terminal brain cancer. Mile after mile. Downey was awarded the Order of Canada for raising awareness of the history of residential schools. 29 people were honoured, their lives spent as artists, as mentors and educators, for helping to heal the wounds of the past. The only cloud? Governor General David Johnston's comments on CBC's The House this weekend, implying Indigenous people were immigrants. We're a country based on immigration, going right back to our, quote, Indigenous people, unquote, who were immigrants as well, 10, 12, 14,000 years ago. Today, he apologized. And let me apologize for not expressing myself correctly on this matter recently. Indigenous peoples are the original peoples of this land. But most here were focused on the positive, on the growing national interest in Indigenous people and culture. We are at the tipping point and I think that we are really seeing um, an a dynamic that we've never seen before. Wilton Littlechild, a former commissioner on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, is pleasantly surprised by what he's seeing. The worst fear I had was that our report would just uh, sit there and no action would happen, but it's, it's the reverse. All of that color goes away. Singer and activist Tom Jackson brought many to tears in a tribute to those who've worked so hard. You made a contribution to a nation. But I think you made an, a national contribution to humanity. This celebration of Indigenous achievement is leading up to Wednesday when Canada marks National Aboriginal Day. Margaret McDermott, CBC News, Ottawa. The room may not have reacted strongly to the Governor General's comments on Saturday, but there is still some anger online. Johnston's apology tweet was also offensive to some for saying our Indigenous peoples. A few replies rejected that, saying, we are not your possession. Author and educator Hayden King said it has the same intent as the term immigrants, calling them both engineered remarks to legitimize Canada. A Commons committee has released its report on Indigenous suicide today after a year of studying the root causes and possible solutions. They are suffering from intergenerational trauma as a result of decades of unjust discriminatory policies that we must, as a nation, all act together to restore hope. The report recommends increased support for housing, education, infrastructure, improving access to mental health services, including crisis intervention and aftercare. It also stresses the need for community-led solutions. The overall suicide rate among First Nations communities is about twice that of the total Canadian population. Two construction workers were killed on the job in Newfoundland today. It happened in the community of Come By Chance, related to the construction of a transmission line that will run from Bay d'Espoir to the Avalon Peninsula. Sources tell CBC News that a steel tower fell on a parked pickup truck, killing the two people inside. Newfoundland Hydro says all construction on the transmission line has been stopped. Combat sports are clearly not for the delicate. Even experienced fighters assume a big risk every time they enter the ring, chancing serious injury, even death. Sports officials in Edmonton are now investigating after a part-time fighter died of his injuries following a recent match. Aaron Collins has that story. These would be Tim Hegg's final rounds. The veteran fighter knocked out cold by a left hook from former Edmonton Eskimo Adam Braidwood. He would get up off the canvas, but would later die in hospital. Well, Hegg wasn't new to fighting. As a mixed martial artist, he fought 34 times, including several bouts in the UFC. But this was just his fifth boxing match, and news of the terrible outcome spread quickly. It doesn't seem true. Sean McMillan had known Tim for nearly 20 years and has seen most of his fights. He wasn't at this one, but says watching the video, he felt something wasn't right early on. I would rewind it and just look at the, his face. It just kind of looked disorientated and, you know, uh, just didn't seem like he was 
was him there. This is just one of the gyms where Tim Haig honed his craft, first as an MMA fighter, then as a boxer. But some say his final fight should have been ended long before its tragic ending. He gets knocked out cold and it's a really bad knockout. MMA training. Prize fighting is inherently risky, but this boxing writer says Haig took too much punishment in the first round of the fight to come out swinging in the second. And you could art, like easily make an argument that the referee, even Tim Haig corner, those kind of things, should have stopped the fight in the first round, between the first and second round, any of those times. And what, if anything went wrong, will be investigated by the group that regulates fights in Edmonton. Or do our existing procedures and policies ensure these events are as safe as possible? And this was, this was just a, a, a tragic event? Or is there lessons we can learn? And when Tim Haig wasn't in the ring, he was here at the elementary school where he taught grade four. Popular with students, Haig will be missed. He's my buddy and he, he showed us a lot of stuff and he's, he's a really great MMA fighter and stuff. And I, really, I really thought that was really interesting. Friends say Hag's biggest fan was his young son. A GoFundMe page to help the Hag family with expenses has already raised $20,000. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Edmonton. It's a practice the UN describes as torture, and today a bill to address it was tabled in the House of Commons. The government wants to limit the time prisoners can be subjected to solitary confinement. But critics say this legislation still leaves room for abuse. Alison Crawford explains. Ashley Smith is how the government got here today. The young woman with serious mental health issues who choked herself to death in solitary confinement while guards stood by and did nothing. The coroner's inquest into her death said indefinite solitary confinement had to end. An act to amend the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. The bill table this afternoon doesn't go that far, but it does propose to limit solitary confinement to 21 days, eventually reducing that to 15 days, and any violations would be examined by an independent external reviewer. The objective here is to make sure that what we're doing in the correctional system is actually addressing the issue and making the situation better rather than treating people in a way that's completely inappropriate and just makes the problem worse. It's a step but it's a very weak step. This corrections expert was expecting more, especially when it comes to oversight from an external reviewer. They're advisory only. They can only make recommendations. The system is still going to have the final say. And they'll have all kinds of reasons to give you as to why that's how it should be. This will be a big change for federal corrections. In mid-May, 224 inmates had been in segregation for more than two weeks. 22 had been there more than 100 days. The United Nations declared any stay longer than 15 days is considered torture. The use of solitary confinement in federal prisons plummeted when the Liberals came to power without any real change in policy, which just goes to show how arbitrarily it was used. As for this bill, it'll be some time before it becomes law, given it was introduced just a few days before Parliament rises for the summer and two weeks before the federal government goes to a court in B.C. to defend its use of solitary confinement. Alison Crawford, CBC News, Ottawa. A week since he was returned from North Korea in a coma, a young American student has died. Otto Warmbier was taken prisoner and held in North Korea for 17 months convicted of stealing a propaganda poster while on a tour. North Korea says he developed botulism after his trial and eventually slipped into a coma. American doctors rejected that, saying his brain was starved of oxygen. His family believes he was tortured. Straight ahead, they're coming to this country, breaking the laws and getting away with it. You can't just sit back and play with your own little world. There are other worlds out there, lots of them. And you can't just ignore them or brush them aside. You see, the world you know is really made up of lots of other worlds, and all of them have their own problems, which, in fact, become your problems. And worlds aren't made up simply of problems. Good things happen, exciting things and they all affect you. The thing is to understand what's happening. And to understand, you have to have a complete and comprehensive view of matters. 
And where to get this information? It's easy. The National News, nightly, on CBC Television. So welcome other worlds into your life. It's almost fun. The National News. Five nights a week in the National Newsroom of CBC Television, the stories come in from all parts of the world to be interpreted and prepared for use on The National. The facts are checked and the backgrounds gathered. On-the-spot reports are collected. Then the films and the tapes are evaluated and edited, readied for the air. CBC's correspondents in all corners of the world report and interpret the news. Wherever things are happening, you'll get the complete information right here on CBC Television. I'm Warren Davis. Those are just some of the things that went to the national. Join me. From here, each day at 1 o'clock, Canada is given the exact time. 60 Canadian radio stations relay the signal to the nation. The CBC brings you the Dominion Observatory official time signal. The beginning of the long dash, which follows 10 seconds of silence, will indicate exactly 1 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. One o'clock, Eastern Daylight Time. That's a real block. Oh, <laughs> Man, it's towering in front, isn't it? But How is that possible? It's jumped up all the way along yeah, the flat, these are newly released images of last week's horrific London high-rise fire at Grenfell Tower, taken by a fire crew speeding to the scene. As you can hear, they're stunned by the sheer scale of the disaster. 79 people are now dead, or presumed dead, but police say that number may climb again. Londoners held a moment of silence for those victims today as the investigation continues. Police will look at everything from how the Grenfell Tower was built and later refurbished to how it was managed and maintained. And these new drone images give you a look at the devastation caused by massive forest fires in central Portugal. It almost looks like a war zone. At least 62 people are dead, but there are also remarkable tales of survival, including a group of 12 people who hid in a water tank as the flames tore into their village. Diplomats, as representatives of their nation, are supposed to be on their best behavior. But documents obtained by CBC News show, with some officials posted in Canada, that isn't the case. Traffic violations, unpaid debts, and passport fraud. Just a few examples on a long list of offenses. Catherine Cullen reports. When you look around here in Ottawa's Sandy Hill neighborhood, you see a lot of big, beautiful embassies, places where just some of the 8,000 foreign accredited representatives here in Canada work. Now, most diplomats represent their country with pride, but a few do get busted for misbehaving. Here's the data that we obtained through access to information, more than two years worth of reports. The names of the countries and individuals involved are blacked out for reasons of privacy as well as international affairs rules, but they do show that the number of rogue diplomats behaving badly and getting into trouble is on the rise. Early quarterly reports show just a handful of cases. The most recent, a couple dozen. There are the unpaid bills, salaries, rent, property taxes, one diplomat left Canada owing $4,700 to a car dealership. The biggest bill we saw, one embassy, and again, we don't know which, owed the Canada Revenue Agency more than $280,000. One diplomat tried and failed to illegally export two cars from Canada. Others fraudulently obtained Canadian passports for their children. And one diplomat was caught up in a police roundup of John's. 
there are also cases of family and domestic abuse. The most recent quarterly report showed that five cases were referred to the Children's Aid Society. That's much higher than in the past, though the societies say that they're trying to get involved in all cases sooner to avoid family crises. Now, the thing about diplomats is that they have immunity from our laws. The reason for that, the 1961 Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations was ratified by nearly 200 countries. You might even remember a case back in 2001 where a Russian diplomat who was drunk drove his car into a sidewalk and killed a woman here in Ottawa. He went back to Russia and was sentenced there to four years in a Russian prison colony. Ottawa police say when they do get involved, in most cases, the countries want to take care of the problem and are always cooperative. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Britain began divorce talks with the European Union today. Brexit Secretary David Davis called it a good start, even though he backed away from one big demand right out of the gate. Britain abandoned trying to force the EU into immediate free trade talks. Instead, early discussions will focus on what the Europeans want, namely to clarify the rights of EU nationals living in the UK. Britain's bargaining power with Europe has suffered after the Conservative government lost its majority in a snap election earlier this month. Jamie, Kathleen and David are just minutes away with the changing art of the political campaign and how it could affect voters in the next election. Plus. And we're not buying a sweater, right? We're, this is a multi-hundred thousand dollar purchase. A ten thousand dollar detail that was not in the fine print of his mortgage documents. That's coming up on The National. I'll tell you a quick story about Obama. Um, it was a big deal for us. It was, a, you know, the first time that, that I'd uh, had an interview with a, a U.S. president while, while in office. In fact, I think it was the first time CBC had ever had a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with a U.S. president. He'd just taken office. He'd only been there a month. Uh, so it, it, it was a big deal. Um, we didn't get a lot of time with him. I think it was 12 minutes or something it ended up being. Uh, and they were in a real rush to, to move him along because he had to fly out to the western United States somewhere, so the helicopter was waiting on the, the pad outside. So um, they, they bring him in, he, you know, he, it was in the map room of the, the White House right on the, the main floor. He walks in, has his arm out, he says, Peter, welcome to the White House, great to have you here. And I'm going, jeez, this is great. You know? <laughs> guy obviously must watch us online every night. You know? <laughs> so he sits down and we, you know, do a little small talk while they're setting up the mics and everything and that was all very nice. Uh, and then we get into the interview and it was bang, bang, bang. It was all the things you'd expect, Afghanistan, the economy, uh, there was stuff about the, uh, the oil sands. There was a, a variety of different questions and he showed a remarkable knowledge of, of Canada and he'd obviously been properly briefed on, on some of these some of these issues. Then suddenly, you know, it was over. And he says, uh, you know, thanks very much. We shake hands. His people are on him like immediately saying, we've got to go, Mr. President. So off he went out the door. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm going, wow, I just you know, interviewed the President of the United States. And after you turn to the crew to make sure they actually were recording when they were doing it, <laughs> I, I looked at the uh, producer who'd done a lot of the work to, to, to make this happen. Her name was Samira Hussein. She works for the BBC now, right, in, in, uh, in New York. And I looked at Samira, who was sitting on the floor, just, just basically right between the president and I during the, the, the news here, we were just out of, uh, during the interview, but just out of camera range, and I said, so, Samira, how did it go? What do you think? And Samira Hussein was like the gold medal winner at Concordia, or she's like a great young journalist. She looked at me and she went, he's so gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, right, of course, but you know, did we get what we came here for? And she said, I don't know, I didn't hear a word he said. <laughs> 
so as that's happening, there's suddenly this kind of noise at the, at the door, at the, at the entrance, and look up, and it's, it's him again. It's the president of the United States. He's coming back in. He's going, Peter, because, you know, we're... <laughs> He says, I've got somebody you have to meet. And I said, I'm thinking, the President of the United States has somebody I have to meet? This is like crazy. And he's tall, right? I'm, I'm six foot, he's like six two. And the guy beside him was about six five. Big tall guy. He looks at him. And this is the answer to Paul's second question. He looks at him, he says, this is Marvin Nicholson. He's from Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, he's gone out, you know, he's heading to the helicopter, he's met some other Canadian, he's brought him back in the White House. Well, time for the last insider segment of this political season. And it may mark the moment we realize campaigns are changing significantly because of Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau. Let's find out why with Jamie, Kathleen and David all here in studio tonight. So I want to get a sense of how you think political campaigning has changed since we started this panel. But I'm going to use a guide and the guide is you in the first case. This is what you said in 2011 about campaigning. Let's see if it's still true now. Watch this. Uh, I actually worry about something different in the first uh, the couple of hours of the campaign, and that is framing it for the media, framing it for the storytellers who are going to be telling the story, our story, the partisan story, for the rest of the campaign. Because unless you convince those people that you know what you're doing, that you're on top of your game, and that you've got a chance to win, you'll never even get out of the starting gate. You won't even get your message to the public. I don't think anybody doubts that was the case back then, but I wonder now whether social media has changed all that. Yeah, is the I media might, I, itself is as important as it used to be. Yeah, it might have been like right you. then, but I'm sure not right now. Um, we've seen that completely upended. Obviously, the example everybody uses is Trump, but Trudeau as well. And, and one of the things that happens now, when you wanted to put your message on television and you had to go through a journalist who would fact-check what you had to say, or when you wanted to put an ad on television, you had to get a telecaster number, you had to prove to the television people that what you had to say was correct and true. Now you don't have to be right anymore. This whole world of fake news that exploded in America, I predict, is coming to Canada. And so as long as you're out of the gate with something, you don't have to convince those people anymore. You just have to speak in an echo chamber to the people that already believe what you, what you have to say. Do you agree with that, Kathleen? Well, I do think that Trump showed us how we could get around a paid media strategy. We talked about that on the show before and how you could even get around an earned media strategy, you know, by him using the social channels as effectively as he did. But that said, I think since since we started the panel, you know, seven or eight years ago, I think the pendulum has swung so dramatically to the science of data, right? Collecting data, the kind of new ways to target and ID voters. We can figure out what triggers them, what motivates them to vote. We do behavioral modeling now that we how we we mine social feeds like Facebook to figure out who these people are. That's what Trump did in the campaign. And I actually think that in some ways we do need to go back to the basics. And I think that a, a strong message and the number one job of any campaign is really to persuade and engage. And if you get away from that, you know, your campaign ultimately I still think will fail. David? I actually would really agree with that. I mean, I, I, it's clear that um, <clears throat> mass media is not what it was, but nothing else is what mass media was either. And I still think that the framing out of the gate of a campaign <clears throat> by the media is very, very important. And uh, certainly they can do you tremendous damage if they consider that you've made a mistake or you've come out of the gate very weakly. But I think that to the point that, uh, that Kathleen was making is that we went through a cycle of really data-driven, micro-targeting campaigns, the kind of thing Susan Delacour talked about uh, in Shopping for Votes, about mm -hmm. how you identify tiny micro-segments of the population and what's the thing that's going to appeal to them. That's where the conservative, uh, for instance, tax boutique tax cuts came from. And I think what we saw in the last campaign, and what I think is is still true, is that a big inclusive narrative trumps that kind of micro-targeting mm -hmm. campaigning. And nothing communicates a big inclusive narrative still better than television. 
So I don't. I think I don't. I think uh, television's yeah. demise at the moment is greatly overstated. Who knows what's to come? But I think that's the key point. Who knows what's to come? Mm -hmm. The past is in prologue. <clears throat> what we're going to see going forward is like nothing we've seen in the past. We now have people talking to each other in very narrow segments. Much more difficult to move them off the position they're on. And I think we're we, everybody's got to be uh, holding back and really looking to say, you know, just where are we going? Mm -hmm. um, now it's David Stern. I want to pull back at a, from that same campaign, 2011. Your thoughts oh, at that time? <laughs> no, your thoughts at that time. Hairdo. They may yeah. they, they may not have changed. No, your hairdo is considerably different. But then, <laughs> but then so is mine, right? Uh, but watch this on polling, David. Watch this. Um, in fact, as people now tell you, our polls, our internal polls are different than the public, they're almost certainly lying about that uh, because there's so many public polls and they're all going to be roughly right. So it's not like they're all missing it and there's a, there's a big difference going on in the campaign. Okay, so the polling business has taken a bit of a beating since then, yeah. but is it still as important as it was then in the campaigning structure? Absolutely. I don't think there's a serious campaign that doesn't test at least all of its ideas uh, through polling and really drive, have polling as a foundation of its strategy. Mm -hmm. The issue with polling is very, very simple in election campaigns, is that the polls are still very, very accurate at telling you what 100% of the population thinks. But somewhere between 50 and 60% of the population votes. And polling has become, has had a very difficult time, pollsters have had a very difficult time modeling who that 50 to 60% is. And to get that wrong, even by two or three percentage points, throws you off dramatically. So it really is the challenge to the polling industry, and nobody's been able to crack this nut, is to really identify who the likely voters in, in the uh, population are. Mm -hmm. Jamie on polling? Yeah, I think one of the things is that you can no longer re rely just on polling. So I think David is right. Polling is great for discovery. It's great for understanding what the issues are and what dimensions of those issues matter and to whom, right? In a, in a fluid and dynamic campaign, we're obviously some lumpiness in terms of predictions. But then there's other things that we can use. We can watch money coming in. Is the money coming into the campaign from existing donors or is it from new donors? People are not giving money for the first time to a campaign that they're not going to vote for and support. Mm -hmm. So if you see a, a big surge in that. If you see a big surge in turnouts in teletown halls and other communications tactics we can use, we can stitch that together with polling and, and make sort of a melange which gives us a better idea of what's happening. Yeah, it's a whole constellation of data points or inputs, really. Uh, fundraising, as Jamie mentioned, rally size is actually really important. Membership numbers, I mean, let's just take the example, the recent example of the Conservative leadership race. Their membership numbers went through the roof, over a quarter of a million, and so have their fundraising dollars, you know. So I think looking at all those points, um, but it is true over the last number of years we have faced kind of uh, some challenges in the, in the polling industry. I mean, the Redford case was one of those where we all thought uh, the Wild Rose is going to win and, and then it turned out not. But, but we didn't because we, we when knit you those the data together. Points, exactly. exactly right. yeah. Then you look at her fundraising, you looked at her numbers, they were solid. Those things can be misleading though, let's be honest, right? Because big crowds don't necessarily mean anything. Um, donors could be coming from your existing base. There's nothing that has, if polling is not quite as accurate as it once was, again, nothing has come along that is remotely that representative. Mm -hmm. So those other things can be additional nuances you right. consider, right. but they wouldn't replace it. Mm -hmm. All right, let me um, we touched on this a little bit in the in the first couple of answers, how, how Trump especially, but Trump and Trudeau have changed the game of campaigning from the point of people like you. How significant has that change been beyond the things we've already talked about? David? I think what Trump and Trudeau tell us right now is that every election is a change election. Okay? In the last electoral cycle, in, for, leaving aside Trump and England and everything else, in the last electoral cycle in Canada, um, most of the, the federal government and most of the provincial governments changed hands. All but one of the provincial governments that didn't change hands changed their leader. So the status quo is losing everywhere. Most people are fundamentally dissatisfied with the present, about their standard of living and with the way the economy is working, and they're scared about the future. And if you're not promising change and delivering change, you're going to be in trouble. So... Um 
I don't. I, it's an interesting thesis, but I'm not sure if I agree that every election uh, from now onwards is a change election. But I do think that when you, when the electorate is faced with a change election, like they were with Harper in 2015 or in 2016, the U.S. presidential, that they will always choose real change versus incremental change. So you actually have to have dramatic change and show how things will be different. And I think we're seeing that in other ways in other parts of the world. You know, with Corbyn, with uh, you know, with Bernie Sanders to some extent. You know, when people are reaching for more um, dramatic and ideological change as opposed to, say, a Hillary Clinton, more of the same. You're still working with Kathleen Wynne? Yes, I am. How are you going to frame what you just said about change with Kathleen Wynne? Well, because she represents change in policies, not change in personnel, but change in policy. So if you're a person that believes what I just said about the economy, and you look at a person that is making tuition fees uh, free for most people, that is br making drugs free for people under the age of 25, that is testing a basic okay, income pilot. Okay, we don't pilot. have to go through no, okay. <laughs> They're going to ask for equal to time here for a moment. Well, what I'm saying is My that Jesus. is a package that is designed to yeah. say we represent policy change, right? And the other people are the status quo candidates in policy terms. So if you want change people change people one, right? one line I, I would be if you want to if you want policies that address people's needs and are socially responsible, you'll actually choose the candidate that has consistently backed them like an Andrea Horvath. You know, <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right. All right. Do you want your 10 seconds on the conservative? I think that when we talk about change, <laughs> I think when we talk about change, it was really important to zone in on the change of tactics available to campaigns. And, and yes, television is still important. And yes, conventional polling is still important. And yes, all these things that we've relied on are still important. But something is happening when we're able to get rid of the intermediate and anybody can be a propagator of news or a point of view. You don't need to have a lot of money. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to have an organization. You just need to have some connectivity to, the, to Facebook or to Instagram or to something mm -hmm. else. And you can cause a lot of trouble. And we need to be alive to that and what it means. I don't know what it means yet. But what I do know is it's going to be a lot different than it was before, even in the last election. This stuff is changing really fast. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to quickly show uh, uh, something from Kathleen. It wasn't in 2011. It was actually 2015, the last federal. Watch this. And it starts like this. It literally starts with the door knockers, the outside scrutineers, who will knock on a door and say, Hi, I'm Kathleen Monk. I'm a Megan Leslie volunteer, and, and I'm here to ensure that you're going to get out to vote. And we ask really key questions, and they are, what time do you plan to vote? Do you need a ride? How are you going to get there? Now, you know, I'm assuming that's never going to change. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not going to change yet. Yeah. In, in spite of all the changes that are taking place, that kind of uh, contact with voters is not going to change. Mm -hmm. That contact is really important. What has changed slightly is the language that I highlighted in that clip, where we actually ask voters to articulate their entire plan, not just, are you going to vote, Peter? Yeah, I'm going to vote. It's like, tell me about it, because um, psychological <clears throat> you know, studies have proven that when people actually have to verbally you know, articulate what their plan is, they're more likely to do it. So that's what campaigners and door knockers and organizers are trying to do. And also, year-round engagement. It's no longer just coming around at election time, right? Parties have to be engaged, you know, four years out. You know, that's why you see the parties in Ontario, uh, you know, already campaigning for an election that won't take place till next year. Um, we've only got a minute left. And so I, I want to thank the three of you. We've worked together for uh, more than a few years now. And I'm sure the insiders will still have a role to play in the future. But why it's been so important to me, what you three have done, is you've put in many ways a human face uh, on politics in a way that I'm, I'm not sure we've captured before. And I'm not just talking about the people in the back room, but it's talking about the kind of things you've said about the candidates you've worked for and the challenges that they face, uh, you know, in very personal ways that we haven't noticed before. So I, uh, I really appreciate the time working with all three of you. Thank you, Peter. And, uh, and you. It's been a great privilege to be here with you. And Peter, I wouldn't embarrass you on television, but in the uh, room outside, I do have nomination papers for you to sign up for the next conservative <laughs> candidate yeah. in the writing of your choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's my last insiders. It's been a treat for me, and I hope for you, the viewers. Don't go too far away. The National isn't going anywhere. We'll be right back. It has been a wet and deadly 36 hours in northeastern Quebec. All day, local radio has been warning people in dozens of specific areas to leave their homes. 
and if they can't drive out, signal helicopters flying overhead so they can be flown out. At least seven people are dead, several more are missing, and thousands more have been forced to flee. A minister in the Quebec government described the situation in this region as apocalyptic, catastrophic. For more than a day, torrents of water have crashed through villages, towns and cities, taking houses, in some cases entire buildings with it. Like clockwork, every five minutes a helicopter lands, bringing refugees from the flood. These people are from Grand Bay. It was terrible, like a hell. This is what they are escaping, hundreds of homes drowning in mud, hanging by a thread, or giving in to the relentless river. No one knows how many bridges and roads have collapsed, and the landmarks wiped out. This old pulp mill reopened as a museum just two weeks ago. Now it's a $6 million write-off. This disaster is unprecedented in Canada, and so is the relief fund, the largest ever collected by the Red Cross. The money has come from people all over the country, and this region knows it. Same with the destruction. The cars buried under mud, the homes swept out into the river, whole neighborhoods gone. That one house with the now famous foundation that alone resisted. Things people here will never forget, their disaster and the charity of others. Good evening, it's official now. The F-18A has won the fighter plane contract. The winning McDonnell Douglas 18A will cost $15 million a copy and is almost certain to be a highly controversial buy. General Dynamics, makers of the F-16 and the losing company in this competition, has issued a statement saying the benefits it offered were higher than the government gave it credit for, and that the price of the plane the government has bought will go up because of continued problems with it. For all of its weaponry, the toughest battle the F-18 Hornet may ever have to face is the barrage of poor publicity it's now attracting. Its costs have been climbing, and some media reports have described the Hornet as a lemon. Earlier this year, the U.S. General Accounting Office blasted the plane. It was nearly a ton overweight, its undercarriage was faulty, it had problems of drag, reduced engine thrust, range, and its acceleration was below specifications. Canada now has nearly 40 of them and expects to buy 100 more. Each of them costs 30 to 40 million dollars. Today it was revealed that the CF-18 and its American cousins of the United States Navy have the same problem. Cracks have started to appear in the tail section when the fighter does the combat maneuvers it was designed to do. It's a relatively minor uh, problem. It's one that is readily identifiable. The cause is known. This latest fault is sure to add to the criticisms of those people who felt that Canada should have bought many more of a competing aircraft, a fighter that came with a much lower price tag. Breaking a mortgage early can come with thousands of dollars in penalty fees, but not many people know a key piece of information that could save them a lot of money in those charges. The Toronto homeowner in our next story didn't know because that detail wasn't there in his mortgage paperwork. He contacted Go Public's Rosa Marcatelli. Absent from Nadim Kara's mortgage contract was a little-known rule. Homeowners with terms longer than five years can only be charged a penalty of three months' interest if they break their mortgage after the fifth year. He was a few weeks away from that five-year mark when he sold his house. Waiting would have reduced the penalty from 13000 to 3000 I mean, we're not buying a sweater, right? We're, this is a multi-hundred-thousand-dollar purchase, and in many other cities, millions of dollars. The fees for breaking a mortgage are supposed to be clear in the contract, how they're calculated and how they'll change over the life of the mortgage. If I had all the information in front of me, I would have made a different decision, and I think that's the key. After learning Go Public was involved, Carl's mortgage company agreed to charge him the lower penalty. First National Financial blames the broker for the problem with the contract. The broker blames the mortgage company. Experts tell us the problem is with the rules. They are so convoluted that they leave Canadians looking to break or renegotiate their mortgages confused. Sometimes people get sticker shock when they get their discharge statement from the lender. 
Bridge has won cases where banks have incorrectly calculated penalties or they fail to clearly disclose penalty information to homeowners. It is heavy. Whoa! Uh -oh. Kara and his family say they're happy First National lowered the penalty, but he says more rules and clearer ones are needed. There is an inherent conflict in financial institutions between disclosure and, and maximizing profit. And so in industries where that tension exists in, in terms of client-facing services, uh, that's where the government has to step in and provide direction and, and instruction. Seven years ago, the federal government's budget included a promise to standardize the calculation and disclosure of these mortgage prepayment penalties. But despite that promise, not much has changed. In fact, these days, penalties associated with paying out mortgages early is the top complaint received by the country's banking ombudsman. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. That story came to light after the Toronto homeowner reached out to our Go Public team. You can also get in touch directly at gopublic at cbc.ca or through our website. When we come back, preserving a moment in time when Canadians stepped up and showed the world who they are. Time for a look at the day's business numbers. The TSX increased 73 points. The dollar closed up almost a tenth of a cent. In New York, the Dow reached another record high, gaining 144 points. The price of oil dropped 54 cents a barrel. Monday, October 19th. The slide that didn't stop. Stock markets around the world go into a tailspin. It's Black Monday. There's never been a day like this one on the stock market. Panic selling has shattered records. Fear, pandemonium, and incredible force wreaking havoc in financial markets throughout the world. It's bad, bad. One word, plummet. Panic selling. Panic yeah. selling, that's all it is. Crazy in there, it's really busy, it's really hectic. Jeffrey, uh, not a good day. By the closing bell on the New York Stock Exchange, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had plunged a record 508 points for a one-day loss of 22.6%, far surpassing the 12.8% drop on October 28, 1929, the day some say heralded in the Great Depression. The Great Crash of 1929. The day the market fell, stocks plummeted in value, paper fortunes wiped out, and much of the world left with a headache that lasted for a full decade. What was it like you were there 40 years ago? Like, well, it was bedlam and madness and, uh, and, and fright and terror and uh, in some cases people committing suicide who had, had several million dollars at one moment and then within a week they had nothing. Could it ever happen again? I suppose everything can happen again. Stock markets around the world went on a wild ride today. 190 points in the morning, then down again, then up again, finally closing up by 102 points, a record one-day gain, which nevertheless recouped only a fifth of yesterday's big losses. They're all coming back now. Even the dogs have a new day. The economic fundamentals in this country remain sound, and our citizens should not panic. Governments today acted swiftly and decisively. They lowered interest rates and they pumped billions of dollars into the financial system. Moves designed to end the fear that the stock market crash will precipitate an economic recession. It's just a crazy market. You can be dead in 20 minutes. We're looking for some more sizable swings, sometimes up, sometimes down for the next few weeks, before it's really clear what the trend will be. Another volatile day on financial markets throughout the world. Prices started plunging in London. Panic quickly spread as Wall Street opened for business. And it put all other North American stock exchanges into another nosedive. I'm having a weekend to you. One more day to go. Thank God. Lose my voice. It is. I know that. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. In the U.S. alone, $600 billion were wiped off the value of stocks in a single week. Investors could only watch in helpless fascination. Even if you lost tens of thousands of dollars, you know, you could find something... Yeah, it was fascinating. The way sometimes a bloodbath is fascinating. I was just thinking about 75 years ago, I used to be doing what these guys are doing. 
That's what I was thinking. 99-year-old James McRae flew a Canadian-made Canso warplane like this one in the Second World War. He and six veterans traveled to Fairview, Alberta to watch it take to the skies again. The plane was damaged and sat idle for years until a group of dedicated volunteers decided to bring it back to life. The restoration took a decade. A special Heritage Minute is making its debut tomorrow on television and online. It marks a defining moment in Canadian history that's still relevant today. And for the first time, this one includes people who are still alive to tell their own story. The CBC's Carolyn Dunn has more. My mother said we had to leave home. But we had to go. We had no choice. Yeah, because the communist government, communist government come. The Trins were among a million refugees who fled Vietnam in the mid to late 70s after the fall of Saigon. Up to 400,000 of them died at sea, but a rickety, overcrowded fishing boat was the only way out for Sam, Rebecca and their young daughters, Helen and Judy. The family left virtually everything they had behind. Twice, pirates boarded their boat and took the rest. They look very, very mean. <laughs> they carry an ox, knife, and gun. They took everything from us. Gold, jewelry, and you and our, our wedding ring. Judy Tran is a freelance journalist living in Ottawa who regularly contributes to CBC. Help and why some people are giving up. The story tonight on CBC News. It was her account of the family story that inspired the Heritage Minute. She was just four years old when they escaped. Gnawing hunger outweighed any fear of pirates. She remembers her mother frantically looking for anything to stop her crying while the dangerous marauders were on board. It was a flattened taro root bun. Um, it may have been there for days, it may have been moldy, but it was enough for her just to hand it to me and for me to eat just so I would stop crying. But that was not the most harrowing part of their journey. The most frightening thing was um, when, we, when, the, when we arrived to, close to Malaysia, the, um, the, the Coast Guard, they, they wouldn't let us stop. The captain sunk their boat. The Trins had no choice but to throw the children in the ocean and swim for shore. Want to make a quick decision how to get off the boat as soon as possible, eh? Jump down into, into water. I arm, then I arm the uh, duty and swim to the song. They spent three months in a refugee camp. Then came the Canadians, posted at camps throughout the region. Did you study French in school? Scott Mullen was one of the Canadian immigration officers interviewing hundreds of people each day. There were no records, no computer databases. So as Mullen told the CBC's Peter Mansbridge back in 1979, decisions were made mostly on gut instinct. 38 years later, Mullen is moved to tears watching the Heritage Minute's portrayal of this pivotal role in Canada's history. As we go through debates, as we did not so long ago, around the Syrians coming, um, we sometimes, you know, forget to look back a little bit and say, you know, we have a tradition of actually doing this reasonably well in Canada. Certainly, the Trin family is a success story. It's a, a miracle, and we were aware that we had to give back. Nobody wanted us. Welcome to Canada. Canada chose us. Canadians opened their borders, their homes and their hearts to more than 100,000 refugees fleeing persecution after the Vietnam War. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And finally tonight, word that the NHL's last remaining original Winnipeg jet has been grounded. Shane Doan was on the Jets team that moved to Arizona in 1996 and became the Coyotes. And he's played there ever since. In fact, he was named team captain in 2003, making him the longest serving captain in the NHL until now. The Coyotes have opted not to give the 40-year-old another year on the ice. So he's free to play anywhere, including back in Winnipeg, 
where there's been a new Jets team in town since 2011. Not that we're suggesting anything. That's the National this Monday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Peter Mansbridge. Thanks for watching.